Good morning, church. Thank you, brother. Thank you, worship team. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Great that we get to uh, start uh, the new, what is it called, brother? Chosen generation? <laughs> uh, with the youth. Um, Sister Sandy and I were actually in the lobby just reflecting on our childhood. and I don't know. I think it's special. Um, you know, I've, I, we were reflecting back and, um, you know, going to Sunday school when we were little. I mean, I loved going to Sunday school. Like, I looked forward to going to Sunday school. Um, there was just something, I don't know, back then, there's just something innocent about it. Someone told me Jesus loved me, and I believed it. It was good enough for me, and there was a God and watching over and taking care of me. And once again, that was good enough for me. And, and then, you know, we all grew up in the world, got influence us, and we said, ah, maybe he doesn't love me that much. And ah, maybe it doesn't matter that much. <laughs> but there's a real innocence to it, so I pray that they will learn about the things of God. And uh, I pray, no, first and foremost, that they will know of his love, that they will know the love of God. I know I, I, know I did, and I, I hold on to that still to this day. But I pray they'll be fearless because they have God, because they know he's with them and never leaves them and forsakes them. I believe that'll change the way you live, if you can live with God and live fearlessly, amen? I bless God for that. Well, uh, if you saw the title this morning, um, yes, it is a reference to a movie, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> I remember my boys when they were little and uh, they had the pajamas, the, you know, they had the, the light year pajamas, they were pretending they were, you know, Buzz Lightyear, and we, gosh, I don't know how many times we watched that movie, um, but uh, that was the line, of course, of Buzz Lightyear, to infinity and beyond, and he would say with such authority and, you know, such vigor, and um, um, the reason I came to that title, if you remember last week, the, the reason I have this is uh, I actually took notes last week as Pastor Mike was speaking. Now, what I found is, if you actually listen, it's the message is more enjoyable. I was interesting. So. <laughs> but I, I leaned over to Sister Sandy and said, you got a pen? She got a pen. Then I, I don't know, you got a piece of paper? <laughs> like, what do you want me to do, write it down for you too? <laughs> but anyway, I did write some things down because the first thing he said that just struck me and I wanted to write it down was, he started, he probably doesn't even know, I don't, I don't know if it was in his notes or not, he says, but what are your limits? What limits you? As soon as he said it, it struck me. So I wanted to write, I wanted to write that down. And of course, I wrote, you know, I wrote some other things and, you know, the try harder. <laughs> I wrote down, you know, why, why try harder. And, but the very first thing I wrote was, what limits you? Like, what holds you back? What's the, what, are, what are the limits? And, you know, I was given that some thought this week, um, you know, as I was kind of, you know, obviously before the Lord and just praying and reading and, and the answer I came up with was really quite simple. And I think it's, you know, it wasn't my answer, by the way. I believe it's God's answer. It was me, itself. <laughs> because the truth is, you know, if we live a world unto ourself, that's the limit of my world, right? It's the limit of your world. If you only live to yourself, you, that's as big as your world can be, you. But if it's not just yourself, then it is... Can, it can then become limitless. Amen? And of course, I do believe, you know, I think it was, I don't know if it was last week or the message before, brother, because you said, you also said, you know, it's all connected, right? It's like, it's just one giant message. It just, we only get to have your attention for a few minutes every Sunday, but we've got years worth of messages ready to go. It was uh, not about the destination. It was about the journey. It's about the journey. It's about the life lived. And that's, you know, as I thought of that, you know, the life lived, the journey, it is, it should be limitless. It should be to infinity beyond, right? But it should be a journey forward, which is essentially when you, you know, those of you that saw the cartoon or whatever it is, the Disney movie, like he would always say that, like when they're in the middle of trouble, they're hanging on the back of the truck, they're about to get run over, whatever, even to infinity and beyond, you know, and somehow they'd get out of their mess. You know, the dog was getting ready to chew them or something. But it was a, it's, a, it's a journey forward. It's a move forward. And, you know, and Scripture also you know, talks about that. Jesus Christ himself said that. He said that uh, the workman, if he puts his hand to the plow, if he looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom. Why? Because it's a journey forward. Amen. It's a journey forward. Amen. And the truth is, for me, I don't know how you guys are, but 
I think sometimes that what limits me is my yesterday. My yesterday limits me from this kind of journey forward. And it is a journey forward. And it should be done with vigor. It should be done with urgency. Remember when, he, when Jesus Christ said to follow me, he says, ah, you know, somebody died. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Yes. Like, I want you to come now. And then the other one said, well, I got to go home and say goodbye to some folks. He said, <laughs> that's when he basically told them, dude, you ain't fit, man. It's a journey forward. Now, does it mean we don't care about people or God forbid somebody? That's not, that's not what he's saying here. What he is saying is it's spiritually so then I can live a life physically moving forward. For who? For Christ, for God. For God. But I've got to do that spiritually because if I don't do it spiritually, then I won't do it in my life. If I don't progress spiritually, I can't move forward. Come on. And I'm generally stuck in yesterday. Whether that could be my beliefs or whether it could be things that we've experienced or things that have happened to us. Sometimes those things in our lives, they can become so crippling that it won't allow us because we're just overwhelmed and it's like we just can't get past it. Church, you got to get past it, man. Not only by the grace of God and through his, you know, mercy, but he will, he will do that. But it is a, a move forward. You know, Jesus Christ said, I am the door. What do you think you're supposed to do? Not go through the door? <laughs> it's, it's essentially your life. You've got you to go through the door. Now, he also says in Revelations that he says, I shut the door and no man can open it. But the door I open, no man can close. There are certain things, church, that, you know what? I am not able to experience or a door that I'm not going through, perhaps yourself included. And then there are other places, there is an open door. Go through the open door. You want to know one open door that's always open? Yeah, the house of God. Amen. You can come in this door anytime you want. And, and thank you for saying that, Sister Sandy. And yes, we have folks that are online, and God bless you. But you know what? There is an open door. You can come through the door. Amen. You can actually fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Not to say you're not in fellowship. And again, I'm not, this is no judgments. You, you know we don't preach that. We're not being critical. That's not what we're saying here. But it is a journey forward. It is about a life lived. But you do have to go through the door. And sometimes, church, you know what? There, you, we don't have access to certain things. You're not supposed to. If he wants you to, you will. You know we're not talking about doors, right? You know we're talking about people and relationships. Amen. There are certain things that I don't have access to. Well, who shut it? Well, I didn't. God shut it. But then there are certain things I do have access to, like all of you wonderful people this morning. Thank you. <laughs> the door is open. <laughs> but I know it's also ordained by God. I mean, and we can dismiss it and think, ah, no, it's just, you know, whatever. It's our, our choice. I mean, there's tons of scripture that tell us otherwise, but we don't really believe it at times, church. And again, it, it, it is, you know, there is sovereignty in serving God. But I also find peace in that. If you can hear that this morning, the sovereignty of the Lord, you should rest and have peace in that this morning. Because he is sovereign means the door that he doesn't want you to go through. You can't the door that he does want you to go through that you may not want to, by the way, you're still going to go through the door. <laughs> Why? Because he's sovereign. He's without limits, though. He is your two infinity and beyond. There's no way uh, you're going to get there without God. Romans 4, 17, verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Is there something that be not in your life today? As far as you can see or as far as you can understand within your limits, because there's somebody that doesn't have any limits. There's somebody that knows something about infinity. He says, you know what? I call it as though it be. Doesn't he say he knows the end from the beginning? 
The end of what? The end, he knows the end of your life. He knows it from the beginning. He knows the road that's going to, that he placed you on and all that will accompany, accompany that. Now that's a hard one to reconcile. And for the record, so we're clear, he's talking about, he's not just talking about Israel. He said, he's because he's talking about Abraham here. Many nations. Israel was one nation. He said many nations. It wasn't just Israel, church, which I don't even know how we can misrepresent that. What nation isn't included? Well, again, Scripture says every tribe and every tongue. It's every nation. <laughs> and he calls it. As though, even though you can't see it today, because there are some things in my life, church, I just can't see right now. Uh -huh. How about you? Yes. He says, it's all right. I'm calling the shots. I can see it just fine because I'm sitting in heaven. I can see beyond your worldly experiences, beyond your worldly knowledge to infinity and beyond. It is a journey forward. Even when we can't see the journey forward, because sometimes you say, oh, I just can't get there. <laughs> and that's fair, because I have said those words. God says, no, I call it as I see it, not as you see it. And that's the truth, church. God calls it as he sees it, not we see it. Like, just take comfort in that. I know I'm limited in what I see and what I understand. I know that. And even when I see things, I'm like, ah, I know that don't make sense. I don't have to see it. Because he calls it differently. He calls it differently. It's like the two umpires on the field. One can call it, you know, safe and the other will call him out. That's, that's you and I in life. God says, I, 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 I saw the whole play. <laughs> I saw the whole thing. I don't need instant replay either, by the way. <laughs> now, that's, it's hard to, to, to do that. But notice what he says. He quickens the dead. Because Jesus Christ even said that. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life. But we don't believe that scripture either. You think you have a life, even though you, don't, you can just put Jesus Christ to the side and say, nah, not right now. I don't want him in my life. You have no life without him. It's, 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 not, even, it's not even true. Now, what he's saying, when, when Jesus is talking about life and God is talking about life, he's not talking about the limits of a carnal life, because that's not who he is. But he also knows that's not who you are. The life he's talking about is an eternal life. That's the life he's talking about. But when I don't believe God and trust God, I live a limited life. I don't live an eternal life. I live a worldly life. It's bound by what? The earth, the beliefs, the customs, the whatever. And we adopt those. That's why, why do you think he says, unless you hate the world, you, ain't, you can't love me. If you're going to love me, you've got to hate the world. He's not talking about people in the world. He's talking about ideas, beliefs, and customs that bind us to an earthly realm that limit our life. We can't live an eternal life. Not without Christ Jesus. And that's why communion is so critically important for the believer because that is essentially what Jesus was saying in John chapter 6 that you have to you have to partake of him you have to partake of the communion table which is exactly what we celebrated last week and that word communion in the Greek it's koinonia it means to share anything what's anything it's the same as everything. It's the same as all. Anything is anything. You think he just cares about one meal or one religious ceremony where you take the wafer and the wine? And I'm not knocking that, by the way. But if you won't share your life with me, does it really matter if you take that wafer or that cup? Amen. If you won't share your life with me? That's what Jesus was talking about. Share anything. It says to participate. We're supposed to participate in one another's life. That's communion. That's why we have a meal and we have fellowship and we go and eat together and we laugh and we sing and, you know, we, we do life. It's life together. We're sharing anything. We shared in the Patterson's vacation. 
They shared that with the body last week. They shared their life with us. How special was that? That's communion, church. That's, that's the body of Christ, church. But if we don't do that, we are then limited. There is the only way to infinity and beyond is actually communion. Koinonia. Will you share anything? Anything. Anything is anything, church. So let's take a look at that passage of scripture this morning. It's actually in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And it's essentially, you know, if you've got your little header in your Bible, which I have one in mine, and it says, the Lord's Supper. So we'll pick it up in verse 23. And it says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. What did he do? Well, on the night he was betrayed, he decided to have a meal. Amen. On the night. The very same night, somebody betrayed him. Somebody hurt him. Somebody looked to get him. On that very same night, hey, what do you say we all get together and have a meal? And now, church, when people betray me, when pe people come against me, I don't say, hey, let me put up a pot of gravy and get some meatballs going here and <laughs> make sure I got enough cheese in the fridge. Let's all sit down and have a meal. <laughs> You guys? <laughs> Jesus did. Matter of fact, the one that betrayed him sat there at the table and ate with him. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, he decided to have communion fellowship. He decided to share life. That's a tough one. But that's the point of communion. Do you understand? It's not to hold on to the betrayal. The very night he was betrayed. Like he, the dust hadn't even settled yet on this thing. Because we were like, we want to say, no, nah, not right now. Why? Because the emotions are high. I might say something I regret. I'm the only one that's ever said that. <laughs> and then actually have said something that I have regretted. <laughs> Jesus Christ said, no, we're going to have a meal. Amen. On the very night he was betrayed. And so we're clear, Jude, yeah, Judas, yeah, we can beat up Judas. They all betrayed him. In the garden, when they, when they captured him, what did it say? They all fled. Betrayed. I ain't getting caught up in this hot mess. I ain't getting, I'm out, man. Dude, I thought this was like, I mean, it was cool and everything was all right, but they're in here with some swords and stuff. I'm out, man. Like, so much for their conviction. Now, listen, I would have ran, too, like a little scaredy cat. Ah. <laughs> I know you guys would have stayed, but ah, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> we all betray one another. Why? I don't know. I think it's just the way God uses things. Because if, if he did it here, he's going to do it with you. If he did it with his own son, he's going to do it with you, church. What should we do? Plan a meal. Plan a meal. That's what, that's what you ought to do. Verse 24. And when he had, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So after he was betrayed, he, grabs, he grabbed the loaf of bread. We're going to eat. What was the first thing he did after, after he was betrayed? Scripture says he gave thanks. Amen. Do we give thanks when we're betrayed? No. No, of course not. We say, let's round up the posse. <laughs> Mike, get the boys. <laughs> we got some business to attend to. <laughs> Which I have done. Why? Because I'm selfish. Because I'm prideful. Because I don't understand the power of God. Uh -huh. I understand the power of the world just fine. I don't understand the power of God. I was just foolish. I, didn't David say that? I was an ignorant beast before you, Lord. 
I was just an ignorant beast, man. Just acting out on my beastly nature and wanting to go wreak havoc on somebody's life. And I forgot that the power of God was with me. And so God would call us to do that. But he gave, he gave thanks. And the bread church, you know, I see the bread here is really a picture. Again, he, Jesus Christ said that I was the bread of heaven that have come to give life to the world. The, the bread of heaven is supposed to give life to the world, not the bread of the world. The bread of the world, the Bible talks about it being deceitful, <laughs> manipulative. <laughs> How do you know it's God's bread? I don't deceive you and I don't manipulate you. Instead, I've got to be the bread of heaven, which gives life to the world. It didn't take life. It gave life. And the bread is a picture of that. It's just life. You can't live without food. You can't live without bread. It is a picture of life itself. Uh -huh. It was the bread of heaven that gave life to the world. The proverb also says that the meek shall eat bread and be satisfied and live forever. The bread is a picture of meekness. Jesus Christ himself was meekness from heaven that came down to the earth to give life to the world. That's why he went to the cross. It was a picture of meekness. Meekness doesn't mean you're shy. Meekness doesn't mean you're quiet. I mean, it can take on that perhaps in certain times, but that's not what that means. Paul, Moses was meek. He led the, he led the Israelites out of Egypt for 40 years and battled and did everything else. I mean, you, you don't, I mean, I know the Bible says that he was not a good orator, but it doesn't mean he was shy and nervous and timid and all this here. That's not what it says. It's, but he says it was, he was meek. He was still a leader of arguably the greatest nation ever. <laughs> the word meekness actually in the, in the Hebrew, anav, it means to suffer a hurt or an injury rather than return it. That's what meekness means. I mean, I know we have our definitions of, you know, hey, I'm humble and this and that. Are you? I pray you are. I mean, I pray I am. Will you suffer a hurt rather than return it? Jesus Christ did. That's the bread. You understand? That's why you got to take of the bread. This is my body. It's broken for you. He was broken. You don't think his heart broke because his disciples betrayed him? Of course they did. But rather than suffer, the, he suffered the hurt rather than return it. Rather than saying, Peter, you stink. Judas, you're a bum. I mean, he could have gone down the list like all of us would have. I mean, I know I would have said those things. Matter of fact, I might have even hit one of them. If I'm being completely honest, as opposed to half honest. <laughs> but you, you need... Bread. He took the bread and he broke it. You know, when, when uh, God restored Job, it says that his brethren and his sisters and his acquaintance returned to him again. What does that mean again? Well, they left him. Right. They left him in his crisis. Who did? His brothers, his sisters, his close friends. They left him but when God returned captivity, when God opened back the door again, they returned to his house. It says they ate bread. There was restoration. There was unity. Which God, of course, is a God of restoration and a God of unity. And then it says that they gave him some silver. The family did. Remember, he lost it all. What were they doing? Helping him get back on his feet again, church. <laughs> they gave him some silver. There was a restoration. And after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, this, is the, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This ye do as often as ye drink in it in remembrance of me. And so then you have the bread, and now you have the cup. And the cup I just see is the will of the Father, church. What is the will of the Father? Well, the will of the Father is your life. Um, whether you believe it or not, it is his will. But what is the will of God? What is his will for our lives? You already know, I think, Pastor Mike, you ain't, you ain't getting more money. Or you might, I don't know. 
But that's not his will. That's the world's will. That's my will. That's my selfish will. What's my selfish will? I want more money. It's not God's will. You think God cares I have money or not? <laughs> or if you have money or not. He doesn't really care. doesn't mean he doesn't care about you or your needs. That's not it. But it's not, it's not in the abundance of things. Scripture also says that. So even for, for us to preach a prosperity message, it goes against the very word of God. Because he says it's not in the abundance of things. So why would I preach a prosperity message to you? That doesn't make any sense. That, that, doesn't, make, that doesn't line up with his word. But the cup is, is just that. It's, it's the will of the Father. But the, the cup is also a picture of redemption, church. What's his will for your life? From It's redemption. It's restoration. It's what he just, I told you about with Job. Peter says that the Lord is long-suffering. And he's not willing that any should perish. What does that mean? It means even though you can't see it, I am going to restore you. Even though you don't believe it, I am going to redeem you. Why? Because I'm long-suffering. I am meek. I will suffer the hurt rather than return the hurt. What will you give me instead, Lord? I will give you redemption instead. That is the will of the Father in heaven. The will of the Father in heaven is never to hurt you, hurt me, hurt anybody, hurt the world, the many nations. That is not. He also says that in Lamentations, I think, chapter 3. The Lord does not afflict willingly. Who does? I do. I want to hurt you when you mess me up. I want to mess you up. I afflict you willingly. <laughs> God doesn't do that. Yes, you may have some afflictions. Because the Bible says also, when you read that account in, in Job 42, that when his family returned, for the evil that the Lord has done. Man, how do you reconcile that, man? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Because again, we just don't understand God. But he doesn't do it willingly. He's doing it to change us the same way he changed Job. He changed Job. Because Job quit whining and praying for himself. You know when he returned captivity? It says, and Job prayed for his friends. Right after he prayed for his friends, it says, God restored captivity. Now he's still in his mess. He's still broke as a joke. He still didn't have anything. But he chose instead to pray for his friends. He didn't choose to return the hurt. Because remember, the th I think Pastor Mike said that, right? The three, he had one good friend, by the way. You only need one. <laughs> I believe it was Christ himself. But the three of them condemned him. In his mess. That's how messed up we are. I mean, church, even when we, our so-called friends, they're in their mess. They're hurt. They don't have anything. What, is, what do we do? Well, we sit quiet for a while, like Pastor Mike said. Okay, you've sat quiet long enough. Now, now let me tell you why you're jacked up. <laughs> they, did, they must have done something wrong. That's not true. And that's not according to God's word. Because God's word, he just said. Matter of fact, Keith, do me a favor. I think it's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Which, Ephesians chapter 1 is a powerful chapter when you talk about the sovereignty of God. Uh, yes, this is it. Thank you. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated. What's predestinated means? It means your life has already been determined by God. That's predestinated. According to the purpose of him. Him who? God. Who worketh how many things? Oh, my Lord. All things after the counsel of who? His own will. Oh, his own will. We don't get a vote. Listen, if I put a vote to you, well, I'm in trouble. You mean, I'm not going to let you vote about nothing. <laughs> I want him voting, and he's the only vote. You want, you want to know? That's voter fraud right there. He's the only vote. I don't want no other vote but his. Now, again, this verse itself, for me sometimes, it brings up more questions than answers. <laughs> it's one of those verses, church. It's just one of those verses. Like, huh? It's already predetermined. He works all things. And it's, it's the counsel of his own will. It's, it's his plans, his destiny. Amen. Yes. But it doesn't afflict willingly. And I know the will of the Father is redemption. 
So, just like Romans chapter 8, he works out all things together. All things is all things. For his good, for God's good, for his will, for, and purpose, for your life. That's what he's talking about here. The cup, Psalms also says that the, the Lord is your cup. He's also, he also maintains your lot. What does that mean? It means it's, already, it's, it's the same thing as here. I mean, there's verse after verse after verse. But we'll, again, we'll gloss over it and say, nah, not really. It was my decision to walk into church today. Okay. It was my decision to go online today. Okay. Not according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. No, it was not. Now, God gave you those thoughts, and God put that and placed that desire in your heart. And Jeremiah says that. I gave you the desire. Whatever desire you got, I gave it to you. Amen. But somehow we want to take even credit for that and say, no, I'm, I'm, I got good discipline. I'm good. I, I'm good. I, <laughs> no, you're not. Because I'm not. <laughs> or maybe you are. I'm not. I know Pastor Mike definitely ain't. <laughs> It's just the will of the Father, amen? For as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's death, not your death, church. The Lord's death. He did what only he, only he could do. Nobody else could have done it. The bread of heaven came down and said, I got the whole thing covered. Don't worry about it. I will definitely absolve the, the world of all of their sins. But even that, that, again, we have a hard time reconciling that one. We have, a, we have a, a hard time accepting that one. Amen. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay, so what is unworthily? And again, we think if we take communion and, I don't know, you didn't ask for forgiveness. Let's say, you, I don't know, you stole your brother's you know, lunch that week, and then you took communion. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have taken Mikey's Twinkies. I was, all right, and now I can take communion because I've asked for forgiveness. And don't act like none of you didn't pray a prayer when they were passing out the communion tray because you, you had sin in your heart. We all did it. And I used to always say, Lord, I know there was some other stuff. I just don't remember it, but please cover that while you're at it. <laughs> you're laughing because you've also done the same thing. We can't even keep track of our sin, church. <laughs> Do you think that's communion? If you're sitting there worried that God's going to zap you dead before you drink of that little cup, is that communion with God? No, no that's cold-hearted religion telling you, you better do this, otherwise I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I take it, and I don't take it right, I'm going to die. I don't take it, everyone's going to look at me and think I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm a bum. I, I, you lose either way. Amen. Holy smokes. Those were some painful days. You, you, you remember, you, you, because at some of the churches I used to go to, you didn't know when they were going to pop the old communion on you. And you walk in and you see the tray up there. You, you want to do one of these because <laughs> you know you ain't right and you can't take it. <laughs> That's not the mercy of God. He's long suffering. God forbid. God forbid that it would chase us away from our relationship with God and one another. That's not God. He's long-suffering, not willing that any will perish. The cup is redemption. It's restoration. I'm, I'm trying to come and give you life. You're killing yourself before I even get a chance to say good morning to you. And we've all done it. But I pray God continue to break all those yesterdays away which keep us locked up and in bondage, just like we're in Egypt. And he says, no, nah, man, not anymore. But what is the unworthy? You know that word? It actually means not congruent, unworthily. Congruency is a, a mathematical term. It's usually used in geometry. It means the two shapes are identical. They fit on top of one another, both in size and dimension. They are perfectly assimilated to one another. What do you suppose you and I are congruent with this morning? Yeah, Christ. Christ. What's not congruent? When I think otherwise. When I think I don't want you at my table. Judas, you're not invited. That's not congruent. That's unworthily. That doesn't fit. It's supposed to fit. That's worthy. What fits? Christ. Christ and Christ alone. 
He's, and, and again, Paul's addressing the Corinthians here and talking about the communion, not because he feels like they got to start taking communion, because if you read it, actually, up, it's up here in verse 18. It says here, he says, first of all, when you come together in church, I hear that there be divisions among you. You're fighting amongst yourself. When you go to church, you're fighting. That's why he's talking about communion. Why? Because you fight. You're not supposed to fight. That's not congruent. You're unworthy. Why? Because you're fighting. <laughs> you're fighting. Don't fight. It's supposed to be congruent. He says, if you do, if it's unworthy, then what are you doing? He's, he's talking about the body. If you can see this this morning, what does that body on the cross represent? It represents represent the old me, the selfish me, the prideful me that was crucified. My selfish, limited life was crucified. When I don't invite you to my table, I'm saying, you know what? I'd prefer the, that worthless, horrible life that's selfish and prideful over having communion with you. Well, that's what he's saying. Well, well. I'm choosing that over, over life. Which, by the way, I'm dead, he says. That doesn't make any sense. And then he says that the, the, there's the, the blood. What, what, what's the blood? The blood is revenge, church. He's talking about Revenge. He's talking about retaliation. Because I'm not, I won't invite you. You're not allowed. That's revenge. That's retaliation. I mean, it is just the epitome. It's, it's, the, it's, it's Isaiah 14. You have placed your throne above the stars of God. You're above it all, man. Doesn't apply to you. Why? Because I don't feel like it. That's why. Why do we exalt ourselves above God? Because I just don't feel like it. My feelings took over. Now I'm no longer meek, am I? <laughs> That's pride. Pride says, I will not suffer a wrong. And in fact, I am now going to hurt you back. Blood. It's the picture of, uh, actually, uh, I... I gave that some thought this week. If you remember from the pictures that we saw from the Pattersons, they showed Herod's palace, not the temple. They showed his palace. His palace was up in the hills, correct? Up, the up in the mountain. He was above it all, church. He was supposed to be the king of the Jews. He was supposed to be in, in basically uniting them and keeping them holy and for the purpose of God. What? It, nah, 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 nah. I got some money now. I'm going to build me this nice. I love it. The palace is up above it all. Church is down here. His palace is up here. Doesn't matter. I'm above it all. That's, that's, that's Isaiah 14 right there. King Herod is Isaiah 14 right there. King Herod, again, he was the king of the Jews. Remember, after Pilate said, this ain't my matter, he sent them to Herod. Herod could have exonerated Jesus Christ. He did not. He was the king of the Jews. Pilate was from Rome. It was, again, it was a church matter, right? The Sadducees, the Pharisees, they brought him in. They said, hey, he's not following the customs and this and that. He says he's the son of God. They took him to Pilate. Pilate this ain't my matter. Herod could have exonerated. He, didn't. he chose not to. Uh -huh. Why? Because he's above it all. And he was a corrupt king. <laughs> he was a horrible king. Yep. He didn't care about the people, and he, he definitely didn't care about God. He was horrible. I even thought about that. You, you, you want to talk about retaliation? So you remember, or maybe you don't, but King Herod, remember, he wanted his brother's wife, Herodias. Yes. He broke up their marriage and took her. He's the king of Israel. Oh, she's pretty. Let me, call, let me stir up some strife in this household and see if I can't take it for myself. He takes his own brother's wife. And then actually, I, I wonder, Reverend, if, if, if they had that party. It says he had a birthday party. And Herodias' daughter danced for him at that party. Would have, been in his, would have been in his palace. There, I think there are three different palaces, but would have been in, in his palace and he said, he was like, oh, my goodness, I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? She went over and talked to her mom. And What do we want, mom? She, again, she didn't love him. <laughs> Listen, she just wanted a better life. Why did she leave her first husband? I just want a better life. He's the king. Again, it's just selfishness. It's all selfishness. But do you remember what she said? 
He said, and he said, I'll give you half of my kingdom. What do we want, mom? I want the head of the Baptist. And why did she want the head of the Baptist? Because John spoke against them. John told Herod, what you're doing is wrong. You're breaking up their marriage so you can have her. You're not, you're not supposed to do that. You're the, you're, the king of, you're the king of Israel. She wanted blood. Think about the insanity of that. That back me, what was the lotto this week? It was like 1.3 billion, I think, or something like that. That'd be like, you know, I hit. And I don't know, I, I come to you and I say, I'll split the lotto with you or we can get back at Mike. And you say, let me see, hmm, $500 million? Nah, I want the head of the pastor. <laughs> Think about the insanity of that kind of hate. Uh -huh. You can have half a kingdom. Nah, I'll take the head of the guy that said something that I didn't like. That's all he did, church. He said something she didn't agree with. Kill him. And of course they killed him. Amen. Blood. No communion. You're the king of Israel. That's, that's, that's insanity to me. That's, amen? amen? It's just our selfish nature, though. We can't even help ourselves. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. We're supposed to examine ourselves. What does that mean? Well, I, church, I think it's real simple. Live by faith. Yeah. Let me examine how I feel right now. Do I want the money or do I want the head of the preacher? I should probably examine that thought life for a second and say, wait a second. We're supposed to have communion here. We're supposed to share lives together. I am supposed to live by faith. Meekness is an act of faith, church. For you to suffer a wrong and, and rather than return it, that is an act of faith. That's what he's saying there. Examine that. Just examine that. Before you move forward, just examine that. Amen? For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean? I just choose the world over God. That's damnation. It means, the, the word damnation it means to separate. Who you se you're not separating you, you, from the world. You're choosing the world standard instead. You're separating from God. I'm separating from God. Why? When I choose unworthily and say I'm not going to partake of that. I'm not going to have the bread and I'm not going to have the cup. We do that to, to, to our own detriment, but we're choosing, essentially choosing the world over God. I mean, the fact is, church, that there is no life without the bread, Amen. which is Christ. And the truth is, there, there's a cup. And Jesus Christ even said, the disciples said, are we going to drink from that? He said, you will indeed drink from the cup. We all drink from the cup. It is always the will of the Father. But the will of the Father is always for what? It's for restoration. It's for redemption. Uh -huh. it's, not for, it's not for hurt. It's, it's Joseph in prison. Yeah. Remember, the, who, who was his two buddies in prison? It was a cupbearer and a baker. Yeah. They all got out. The yeah. But the baker died. Yeah. Who lived? The cupbearer. The cupbearer lived. And really what that is a picture of to show us, I think, is what happened in prison for 14 years with Joseph? Well, I believe he finally got to the true cup. Not my will, but yours be done. Father, if this cup could pass away, but except I drink of it, it is not my will, but is your be done. His will was broken in that prison. It took 14 years, but I believe that's what happened. I believe his will was broken. Why? So that he could serve God and do God's will. To be what? To be a cupbearer. Yes. To be a cupbearer. The, the baker does have to die. The bread is for everybody else. The bread ain't for you. The bread is for everybody else. You got to suffer the hurt rather than return it. Your body has got to be broken for others. But in turn, you bear the cup. Amen. Ask the worship team if they'll come. I pray God continue to give us the strength to faith to continue to increase inside of us to understand that it is God's will, our lives and God's will, they are synonymous. It's us seeing it more readily and understanding it more and being able to live in it and understand the power, the real power that he's given us. It takes the power of God to do that. It's not a natural thing. It can only be the power of God that enables us to do that. Amen.
Why don't you stand while we close? Praise the Lord. Worship team, we are grateful for your ministry because it gives us a time of meditation. So sometimes we want to sing and sometimes we just want to close our eyes. So thank you for allowing that, 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 that opportunity. Amen. Sometimes we want to just meditate. And I think it's important after we hear the word of the Lord to meditate upon it. You know, even as Pastor Phil was preaching today, I'm sure we're very much alike. I say to myself, I say, Lord, what are you saying? You know, it's like, say something to me. Like, what are you saying to me, God? Right? What are you, it's like, what are you telling me? That's why we come, I pray. And what are you saying to me, oh God? And, um, you know, Pastor Phil, um, I've never heard a, 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 a sermon on the Lord's Supper such as that. <laughs> uh, very intriguing. And uh, there's much to learn. So as I, I was asking God that, I believe God is telling us he's um, causing us, or is he teaching us to think a different way? You know, they say of college students, the reason why so many people want college students to work for them, you and I were talking last week, they want college students because in college you're taught how to think, how to process information, how to uh, um, complete assignments. It's not so much the topic, because quite honestly, sometimes the topic in college are, <laughs> I'm sorry, trash. <laughs> but it teaches you to think. And I believe that you might remember everything Pastor Phil spoke, but you won't. But the most important thing is it's causing us to think differently. Don't you agree with that? It causes me to see the Bible differently, to see God differently, to think differently. And God answered the prayer. He's teaching us to think differently. And when we think differently, there's a river of life that flows from that. And I thank God for it, because it's not something we have to do. There's a life that will flow from it, as God teaches us just how to think differently. And even for our chosen generation this morning, may they learn how to think differently. Amen? Not, 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 not the way of the world, but to think differently. And may something tremendous flow from that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Thank you for your presence, oh God. Hmm. Thank you for this moment because the moments are so fleeting. So thank you that you give us this moment. And we thank you, my God, that you change the way we think. Change the way we think. I believe... It's called repentance. Repentance to change the way we think. And may there be a river of life that flows from that. Thank you for our pastor, my God, for his faithfulness to you. Thank you for the faithful word that was spoken today. Thank you for this great house that you give to us. This sanctuary, this hiding place, this shelter. Thank you for this family. We pray the blessings of heaven upon this family, both here and online. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, and everybody says, amen.